Hi everyone. In this video, we will see what is Databricks Connect and how Databricks Connects help to build powerful client-side applications using Spark. So, so in order to understand Databricks Connect or what is Databricks Connect, we need to see the history of Spark, right? So, historically, when we use Spark, uh, say some three years back, uh, we like say the pre databricks era right so we have a edge node so edge node is nothing but it can be your uh, uh, like system your laptop or it can be your databricks in case of database cluster it can be your uh, uh, like say when you enable the web terminal it will be connected to the uh, edge node or the driver node right so what will this do so whenever we run a spark query right or when we say we want to customize the data apps, right? So we want to run PySpark code, arbitrary PySpark codes, right, from my app. Say, for example, I need to build an app where I want to execute some PySpark code on the fly based on user input and then return back the result, right? The challenge with this is, right, in the traditional method or with, before Spark Connect, it has a architecture in such a way, everything is coupled to the driver, right? So what will happen is when you run the code, it needs all the binaries. Say, for example, if the classic Spark, right, we need all the binaries like Hadoop, Java, Python, everything to be installed for running Spark. And again, when we execute a code, it will basically use the driver machine. Say, if I have four or five apps, then all the apps needs to be run through my edge node or through my driver node, which has all the Spark binaries installed. So the problem is it cannot, it will make our application big, right? Because the entire binary needs to be added as dependencies, which will make the app big. And second thing is if we run multiple apps in the same server, right? Uh, maybe we cannot distribute the memory effectively, right? So this is when right, the Spark developers or community understood the issue and they came with something known as Spark Connect. So it's Spark Connect, uh, basically it, separates the entire driver client architecture into two different components and introduces a server model in between, right? So if you see here, so Spark Connect server, right, runs separately. Say, for example, in terms of Databricks, the Spark Connect server runs inside the Databricks cluster or on the Databricks compute plane and from the end user, right? Say, I have a client application, right? So what I will use to say I laptop or my IDE, right? I will just have to install only the Databricks Connect library. I don't need to install Java. I don't need to install all the Hadoop binaries or Spark binaries. I just need a Python library and we can use Databricks authentication and we'll submit the code. So now what will happen is when you submit the code, it will convert your codes into unresolved logical plans that will be sent as protocol buffer. So those buffers will be sent to the cluster driver or the Spark Connect server from where it will start the driver and the uh, executor nodes and it will use that. So in case of data bridge, it leverages the existing cluster configuration and it runs the code, right? Now, <clears throat> so what do we gain in this approach? So one clear gain is Right, say I'm going to build an application which is on REST, right, or maybe on Go language, then I don't need to worry about Java, right? I don't need to install any uh, like Java specific installation in my machine, right? Or say I have Python alone in my machine, I don't have Java or Java home set, right? In that case, I don't need to run anything specific to Java. We are slowly moving away from the dependencies of Java. So, but only one catch here is since it gets the unresolved logical plan and then sends as a protocol buffer to the server, it can execute only the data frame API code. Since RDDs are very low level abstractions, it cannot execute RDD API, but it can execute data frame API as well as SQL API on top of uh, Databricks Connect. Now, Let's see, right? We need to build an application. Uh, so for that, I'm going to leverage uh, Databricks apps. So this is the sample app which I have created. 
So in order to create a new app, you can click on create app and then you can create data app. So then you can give permissions on accessing the servers. So if you want to access a SQL server, you can give access to a SQL server and then click on create, right? So once you click on create, you will get an app like this. So this app, right? It will have a source code embedded under your folder. So if I go to the source code folder, right? I'll have three files. One is app.py, which contains the actual source code for the streamlit app and app.yaml that will have the environment variables, right? Say if I want to store a secret, right? Or if I want to store some configuration files, then I can use this app.yaml, right? So you see here, right? This app.yaml has the SQL warehouse, uh, the, the database warehouse ID, and we also have the command line arguments, right? So how did you, when you start a streamlit application, you should use the streamlit run app.py. So here you can pass on more arguments, right? So all this streamlit specific options can also be passed here, right? Now, coming back to the app. So how can I prove my claim, right? That uh, normal PySpark, right? Needs uh, all the dependencies of Java, everything, right? So what I have done is, first step, I will deploy an app. So this is a earlier version of the app, right? Or it's like a older way. Since this creates a new container, when I deploy an app, right, Databricks basically creates a new uh, like VM kind of thing where it will execute the Python code, right? Like it's similar to function app in Azure or you have your uh, Lambda functions in uh, AWS, right? Now, in terms of requirements.txt, for now, I will use the default PySpark library, right? Uh, so the versions which you how it will run prior to database connect right so let me deploy the app again so coming back to the app plane it will take some start to time to start so let me start the app meanwhile i'll explain the key components right so we have an overview section so this will have the source code and it will have the sql warehouse and other configuration which i have used and it will have the sample code on how to deploy the code. Say you have a local streamlit app and you want to deploy it here. So you can use this command. So you can deploy, develop it locally and then deploy it using this command to your uh, Databricks workspace, right? And in terms of authorization, uh, right? I think since the app is deploying, it's not coming. So you have the deployment. So where it will say you, right? Like whenever you deploy the app, it will give the deployment history. And uh, let us go through the code while the app is getting up, right? So this is a simple code where I have, what I have done is, I want to have a Jupyter Notebook kind of environment, right? So where I will execute arbitrary Python code or Spark code basically, and get the results online, right? Uh, I mean, like an interactive browser. So it's similar to a Databricks Notebook, but we are creating our own version of Databricks Notebook in a client environment, right? Like say, we, are, we want, say developers to follow some standards, right? I mean, we want them to restrict certain commands from getting executed, right? So in such cases, you can come up with your own version of your notebook so that that can be restricted. So now I'm trying to build a simple code, right? So this will give you a streamlit code where you have a cell button, a cell, which will give you the cell number, right? Cell one, cell two, cell n. And we have a run cell button, which will execute the code and we will leverage the Databricks Connect, right? So in order to connect to Databricks using Databricks Connect, right? We have to install Databricks Connect module. So you see here on the requirements.txt, I have commented Databricks Connect. I'll enable it since I have to show you the failure, uh, right? I will enable the Databricks Connect and then uh, we'll rerun again, right? So this Databricks Connect, so I have a, like a separate code cell, uh, right? So here we can uh, say I'm trying to use the Databricks Connect, right? I have created a Databricks Connect and uh, we can execute some arbitrary code using uh, Databricks Connect. So I have a table name, named as uh, Lakehouse, uh, Lakehouse Sales Transaction. So I'm just trying to run some code using Connect, right? So now, so that's all we need 
to convert from a normal old application based on your spar session dump builder. So one more place where I will I feel like this will be helpful is right. Say we are migrating from on prem to Spark or DataBridge Cloud, right? So then what it takes is at the end of the day just a single line where you uncomment this one to make uh, DataBridge serverless. Uh, sorry, the DataBridge Connect option applicable, right? So let's see it has started. So they're starting the app and it is installing the packages. Let's see. Okay. So app has started the Now, so once we have the app, right? So the main key, one more thing which we need to see is the authorization, right? Say I have a database in my data bricks, you see, and I have to give access to that schema. Then I can use this service principle, right? Which is created as part of the app and then give access to my schema, right? So that way we will ensure that the app has enough access to the backend data, right? And we have the logs, so where it is, you can search through the log, right? And it will give you all your uh, historically, like if there is an error happening in the app, right? Or if there is some issues with the app, you can see it here, right? Now, let us click on the app, right? Let's see what is happening. So let me click on the app. Okay, so. The problem here is, right, uh, as we know, Spark, the vanilla Spark or Spark without uh, your uh, Spark Connect needs Java to be installed. Since there is no Java installed, it is failing with the Java Gateway because it doesn't know where is Java running and it doesn't get support, right? Now, uh, let me come to the show environment variable later. Now, let us redeploy the app. Right. Let me go to requirements.tv. Let me go to this one. Let me uncomment uh, the Spark uh, session and comment out the whole the vanilla Spark. And uh, let me come back to the requirements.txt and I will uncomment the database connect and probably comment out with this one. So, I will not need that. so let's uh, run the code. So it looks good. Let us redeploy the app. So one more thing which I see is in Databricks apps, whenever you are making a change to the source code, it will it needs a redeployment. I don't see any automatic way right to deploy the app as of now. Uh, so yeah, it is redeployed again. So let us know. So once the app is deployed, you will get an app screen like this. So where you can execute some arbitrary codes. Let us execute some basic Python codes. So when you execute a basic Python code, it will execute in the local Python environment. It will not even send a call to the remote database. Let us execute some code, right? Let us add PC. And let us add some, read some data from the database. Right? So let me read the data. Right, and then take this out with me. Okay. Say run this one. See, you could see the data from Databricks directly fetched here. So the same can be verified using your uh, Databricks response. And uh, let us try to write back to the Databricks again. It let us do some small as Databricks Connect supports all the basic data from API. I'm doing an aggregation and then I'm showing a limit of five. Okay. So here we go. It gets executed in the back end. Okay. Now let us write the target table. The data. And data is written now. Let us read the data again. That table so, say read the data show the look at a wonderful data bricks notebook like client application 
which can execute arbitrary Python as well as PySpark code and connect back to the data virtual and write the data. So this is a huge step in Spark. So that going forward, right, we can have a Go application or any language which is JVM or non jvm based. We can effectively connect to Databricks without a Java dependency. So we can have a lot of client applications which can read the data as well as write back to the data in any format, right? And they can execute arbitrary transformations on the fly, like no code editor. If you're building a no code application where on button click, if needs to change or execute certain transformations automatically, then you can leverage Databricks Connect. So to summarize, in this video, we saw what is Databricks Connect and how typical old Spark executor uh, or executes it. So which has a dependency on your external library, Java and all the Spark uh, binaries. This will flat like it will this is in a big application code because all the binaries needs to be stuffed with the Spark application, which prevents end users from directly using the Spark. And they mostly use JDBC, but JDBC has its own limitations on the amount of data getting transferred from the Databricks or your Spark cluster to your JDBC code. Now, Spark introduced Databricks Connect, which leverages a client server architecture, and you have all your codes which are written in local, your IDE will be translated to protocol buffer as an Anderson logical plan. Then on the Spark Connect server on your cluster, it will parse those buffs and then it will build a plan and execute the things on the cluster in a remote fashion. So in order to enable Databricks Connect and test the functions, we created an app, so a Streamlit app, which will mimic Databricks Executor, uh, so Databricks Jupyter Notebook like functionality. We tried first with the normal Spark session and it got a gateway error. Then we use Databricks session and then we use serverless option two to true to connect to the serverless cluster in the backend. And we are able to successfully read and write through the app. The same we can also verify if we go to the catalog under the default database. We should see our aggregation product scene, right? So this is the table which is created by the app. And as said earlier, the owner of the table, right, is nothing but the app. So let me change the owner to my name so that later I can remove right? So we are able to read and write from the app. And all the permissions to the app are maintained through your uh, authorization, which is a random hash value or a service principle created for the app. So you can use the UC and control access on the data for the app. Thirdly, we also have the environment variables, so which will allow you to list the environment variables, right? Like, so the one piece which I missed is the environment variable. So if you click on the environment variable, I think, uh, yeah, I have to put the OS module, but that's fine. This will give you all the variables which are defined under the YAML file, right? So that's all I had. Do like, share, and subscribe.